Hi all, um, good morning or evening, afternoon, midnight, whatever time it is. Um, so this is gonna be a lecture about the last part of the water cycles um, PowerPoint, which is mostly about precipitation. Um, this corresponds to the content in chapter five. Um, and I'm gonna turn on the PowerPoint so that you guys can see the slides as I go through them. Um, all right, take care. Okay, so um, we so far have talked about condensation and we said that condensation um, is a process that happens in the atmosphere when the air can no longer hold the water um, that has previously been evaporated or we said that the air is um, ha at 100% relative humidity, it's water ha holding capacity is maxed out, it's saturated, we could say all these things. Um, and we said, basically, this typically happens because the air cools down. It, it is possible that it could happen because more water has been evaporated into the air. But in most cases, this happens when the air starts to cool down and then the colder water can, or the colder air can no longer accommodate the same amount of um, moisture. And so that moisture starts to condense onto condensation nuclei. So, um, of course, there's a variety of ways that air can cool down. Um, we mentioned a lot of times that this happens at night when the sun goes down, that um, heat energy from the solar radiation goes away and the air temperatures can drop um, or new air can kind of come into an area from a colder zone. Um, so we've experienced those kind of things. But the most common way that we actually see air changing um, its temperature is by a process that's called adiabatic cooling. And this process is kind of a sister process to another process called adiabatic heating. And basically what this means is that the air changes temperature not because there's a change in the energy source, right? Not because the sun comes out and shines up down on the air or the sun goes away, um, goes behind a cloud or um, sets at the end of the day. But instead, the air is changing temperature because usually of a pressure change. Um, and as we've learned so far, we know that one of the main ways that air changes pressure in the atmosphere is as it rises in elevation. We learned earlier on in the semester that the air molecules up high in the atmosphere are much more spread out. They don't have the same weight of the air column pressing down on them. And so as a result, they're more spread out which means that they don't bump into each other or press on each other as much. And then they don't continue to bump into each other, which slows the molecules down and cools them off. So basically this process happens when air moves from a place closer to sea level up into um, a higher elevation zone, like up over a mountain, for example. Um, and as this happened, first air starts to rise. And then at altitude, it expands because there's less pressure from the air column. And then as we've again learned before, as there's less pressure, the air starts to cool down. So that is a process of adiabatic cooling and adiabatic heating works the opposite way. When air comes back down in elevation, um, which could happen for a variety of reasons, but perhaps could be as air moves down um, a mountain slope, it will um, collide with increasingly more air molecules and its pressure will go up and then the speed of the molecular motion will go up so the temperature will go up and that process is called adiabatic heating and in this image it's showing a balloon um, that has a bunch of air molecules close together close to sea level um, with a high temperature and then that balloon moving up to a higher elevation place where the air molecules are spreading out and that's causing the rubber or latex balloon to expand, the temperature is dropping, and then the opposite is happening when the balloon is going back down to lower elevation. Okay, so this is important in the context of, um, wait, sorry. This is important in the context of, um, condensation because um, once the air cools off, 
we've learned that colder air has a lower water holding capacity. So as this air is cooling down, it is limiting its ability to hold on to the evaporated water molecules and the water molecules will be increasingly kind of maxing out the capacity of that air to hold on to them and eventually the air will keep dropping until it is maxed out it reaches 100 percent relative humidity this is going to be its dew point temperature which again is not a specific temperature it can happen um, at a different de uh, temperature depending on how many air molecules are there um, but at some point, the air, as it continues to cool, will get maxed out, and then air molecules will be transformed in, back into a liquid that's called condensation. And we can see those air molecules, um, or sorry, we can see those water molecules as they condense in the air. They form little droplets um, that we can see, again, if they're on the ground surface as like dew um, or in the air as clouds. So here's a picture of a cloud. Um, forming over Mount Rainier outside Seattle. And this is a super common thing that you see where air as it moves up and over mountains starts to condense um, around the top of the mountain because once the air reaches that elevation, it's cold enough that moisture that was evaporated down at lower elevations starts to condense out of the air. So um, there's actually a known rate at which the temperature changes which is called the adiabatic cooling rate. And as air rises in elevation, we can expect that it will cool about 10, or not about, exactly 10 degrees Celsius for every kilometer that it rises in the air. Um, so this is basically related to how much the molecules spread apart and then how they slow down, which we've learned is what temperature is really measuring. Um, and there is actually a difference um, when air starts to condense, we've learned before that condensation releases energy back into the environment and actually warms the environment up a little bit. So once the air gets to an elevation where condensation starts to happen, interestingly, it, it actually starts to cool down more slowly because some energy is being released by the water molecules as they're condensing or transforming from that gas into the liquid. liquid. And that counteracts um, some of the adiabatic cooling that we see before condensation happens. And so we call those two different adiabatic cooling rates the dry rate and the wet rate. And those are not numbers you need to memorize for my um, class, but just kind of trying to illustrate that this is a really measurable kind of known phenomenon that we can observe in the air and that can help us guess when clouds are going to start to form and why they might start to form. Okay, so now that we have that content behind us, um, we're ready then to think about precipitation, which is the third part of the water cycle here. And um, precipitation um, is the process of the liquid water droplets that have already formed in the atmosphere due to condensation coming back down to the ground. And so that process can be as rain, as snow, as hail, as sleet, um, but it's the movement of that water resource from the atmosphere back down to the earth's surface. And it might land on a solid, like the land, it might land on the ocean, um, but in any case, that's called precipitation. So um, precipitation varies widely um, around the earth. Um, I don't think any of us will be surprised to know that certain areas, um, in particular the tropics, have really high amounts of rain. Um, and other areas, the, the deserts in our um, world, have very low amounts of rain. And so we think about this distribution of where rain falls as a spatial distribution, a distribution in space. And this has a lot of implications for the kinds of um, living communities that exist in the different parts of the world, which is going to be our next topic. Um, however, what's also important to consider is that there are also important temporal um, differences in rainfall, which means differences in time. And this happens both kind of within the year and also across different years. And so, for instance, if you live in a particular area like 
California and um, in particular Los Angeles, and you maybe get on average 12 inches of rain a, a year, it might be important to know when you're trying to think about how weather will occur and how living organisms may have access to water, um, that the rain is not equal through the different parts of the year, but it is almost always concentrated in the winter and spring, and there's almost no precipitation during the summer and the early fall. So that's called a Mediterranean climate. That's the kind of climate that we're familiar with. This is different than people that live in other parts of the world, like the East Coast of the United States, where precipitation is very um, even throughout the year. And then is also different from people that live in monsoonal climates that we've talked about before, where they get really high precipitation in the summertime, so completely opposite of what we see, and almost no precipitation in the winter time. Um, and so this, again, is important when we're thinking about weather and when we're thinking about um, how this weather might affect life. So another important thing to consider is that, of course, a lot of times precipitation, um, you know, even if we can measure it evenly from month to month, may not be even from day to day within that month, and we can have extreme precipitation events. Um, so for example, um, we had um, a big hurricane, well, we've had several hurricanes. This is a hurricane that um, came a couple years ago um, into um, the area in North Carolina, um, and it dropped um, over 36 inches of rain um, just in a couple days, which is, you know, multiple times the amount of rain that someplace like LA gets an entire year. Um, Hurricane Harvey had some locations um, in Texas that saw nearly 50 inches of rain over a three-day period. Um, and so these extreme rainfall events are important for um, organisms to be, uh, be able to survive that live in the areas that might ex experience these extreme precipitation. Um, event. So here's um, pictures of people um, in the Hurricane Harvey um, event where they are completely inundated with so much water, um, not to mention wind. And we're going to talk about hurricanes in the next presentation. Um, in addition, you might have heard of some phenomenon that are called atmospheric rivers. Um, these are associated with really high rainfall events that we get on the West Coast um, in places like Northern California where we live. And these are these kind of increasingly common precipitation events that are associated with these really long, so thousands of miles long and quite narrow, so maybe only 100 miles wide, bands of very high humidity air that moves from the tropics into the higher latitudes. And these um, bands of air, these air masses, can contain an enormous amount of moisture. Um, one that came to California a couple years ago had more than 15 times the amount of water that flows in the Mississippi River coming into a zone in Northern California um, in the air. And when these happen, they run into the state and they drop enormous rainfall very, very quickly um, in, uh, a sh in a short amount of time in a limited space and they can create lots of flooding uh, and problems like we saw during the Oroville Dam dilemma um, a few years ago. And people that study these have noticed that there's a correlation between warmer um, atmospheric temperatures, which we know are good at evaporating water out of the ocean, right? Warmer air and warmer water can be evaporated more easily. Um, so they've noticed that these events seem to be correlated with warmer temperatures. And so as we increasingly have warmer temperatures in our world, we are expecting that these atmospheric river events will happen more often. Um, and one study was expecting that they will be twice as common um, in Northern California um, by the end of the century. Um, when we're considering um, precipitation distribution, it's also interesting to know um, that there is a lot of what we call interannual variability, so variability between different years. And we know this, one, because we have records of rainfall in previous years that people have collected. Um, and we can also use what's sometimes called climate proxy data, so information that's not in a human record, 
but is recorded um, in some other natural um, place in the environment. And then we can look at that information and interpret what the climate, and in this case, what the precipitation was like. So one of the ways that we study precipitation from the past is we look at tree rings. Um, many of you guys may know that every year a tree puts on a new ring. So this picture shows all these concentric circles that represent one year of growth. And the more moisture that is available in a given year, the wider that ring will be because the tree will be able to grow more and bigger um, new cells. And on the other hand, when it's very dry, the tree rings are really tightly packed together. And so we have many trees that grow in the Western United States that live thousands of years. And so we can look at these tree rings from these really old trees and learn about the climate change um, variability that was existing much before European Americans and other Americans were recording um, temperature records and precipitation records in our zone. And we can learn that there were really extreme long lasting droughts in this part of the world. And so uh, we should have every expectation that this kind of drought is certainly possible for us to experience in the future. And that this kind of drought um, would be much longer than the kind of droughts that we've experienced in the last century, um, not droughts that last five or six years um, or seven years, like the big Dust Bowl drought, but droughts that last, in some cases, like 30 plus years. And so we should be thinking about how our infrastructure might be able to respond um, to these extreme drought situations. Um, here's some more data um, showing um, how drought has changed over time. So the top graph is showing the percentage of area in the West um, that is experiencing a drought. And you can see that the last century is actually a pretty relatively wet area or wet time where there was a low amount of area in the West experiencing drought. And unfortunately, this is the time that we built our infrastructure, that we made policy, that we made different kinds of agreements about how much water is allocated to certain communities. Um, and what we're increasingly realizing is that that amount of water that we kind of expected to have, and we expected to be able to spread around in ways that we have kind of legally binding agreements to do, um, is really allocating amount of water that is not likely to be commonly occurring in the West in a given year and certainly would not be available during these big drought years. So we may need to really think about the way that we have um, an expectation to have access um, to water. Um, so anyway, uh, we just kind of need to be aware um, of how this might uh, play out. So um, there was a big research paper that came out a couple years ago um, that is about a potential mega drought that could happen in the century. Um, and this particular research paper got a lot of press. It was um, published in a journal that's called Science, which is kind of um, typically thought of as the highest quality scientific research publication. Um, and in this paper, they said, um, increasingly understanding the warming global temperatures and some land use changes that have occurred in the West, we have an 85% chance of experiencing a 35 plus year drought in the Central Plains and Southwest in the second half of this century. So that is pretty astonishing and very potentially concerning to people. Um, and again, we don't know 100% that this would happen, but this is increasingly likely 85% chance of something like this occurring. Um, and so with that amount of confidence behind a prediction like this, again, it really behooves us to start to think about how would we be prepared to deal um, with this lack of water? Do we need to change our infrastructure around water? Do we need to change the way that we allocate water to certain uses? And how can we be prepared to live in an environment with much less water than we've had in the past? Um, other comparisons that this paper made were that a drought of this magnitude would be much, much, much bigger than something that we saw in the Dust Bowl and also much bigger than the big droughts that we think likely ended the Pueblo societies um, in 
um, the Southwest of the United States kind of in pre-European times. So again, probably worth spending some time thinking about how we may or may not be prepared um, for those droughts. Okay, so um, moving on, I wanna kind of transition into thinking about more of the mechanics of precipitation. Um, so how do we actually get the water to move from the air down to the land surface? And it's important to remember that many, many condensation droplets that form on these different condensation nuclei in the atmosphere do not fall down to the ground, right? We see clouds lots of times that don't end up as rain. Those clouds may move on or they may evaporate back into the atmosphere um, as the temperature warms. Um, so in order for these water droplets to end up coming down to the grain as precipitation, they essentially need to group together into large raindrops that are essentially big enough to fall through the air and not get um, kind of re-suspended into the atmosphere by any small little movement of air or a little bit of wind. So this can happen um, by two main processes. Um, the first process is called the collision coalescence process. Um, and it happens in warmer clouds where the water exists as a liquid, as water droplets, not as ice, um, solid or frozen water. And in this case, basically what happens is that the little tiny water droplets that have started to condense onto condensation nuclei um, experience a collision, they collide with each other, and then after they collide, they stick together. And now they're twice as big as they were at the beginning. And then they might run into a third small droplet and get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger as they coalesce or start to kind of join up to form these bigger droplets. Um, and eventually these droplets will be big enough that again, they can continue to fall down through the atmosphere without being continually kind of resuspended into the air by any little bit of wind. Um, however, another common uh, way that precipitation happens is when ice crystals um, fall down to the ground instead of liquid rain droplets. And um, these um, ice crystals can form as water molecules um, form ice crystals um, in the cold parts of the atmosphere. Um, and then this, ha this happens when water vapor starts to crystallize um, on a tiny ice crystal um, or other nuclei that it exists in the atmosphere. It's called the Bergeron process. And once this happens, it actually starts to happen really fast. So we might have lots of cold moisture um, that's in the atmosphere and it doesn't really have a surface to bond onto. And then as soon as one little tiny ice crystal starts to form, then a lot of water vapor will start to crystallize um, onto this solid surface very, very quickly. So basically it skips the liquid phase and goes straight from a water vapor um, to a solid um, frozen liquid phase. And so again, that's called the Bergeron process. Okay, so um, these air molecules, um, move around in the atmosphere, and they can fall as rain. If, again, if they get big enough and there's enough of them around, then they'll start to come down to the ground. And so as a result, we have precipitation um, in many places at many times of the year. And I wanna kind of take a moment to go back and think about that we are going to then have precipitation falling in the places where we have had condensation, right? Because if we don't have little liquid water droplets in the atmosphere, or we don't have little ice crystals in the atmosphere, we don't have anything that can fall as precipitation. And so we need those condensation um, criteria to be met if we want to have the option for precipitation to fall. Um, so Basically, um, what we usually think about is that there are four main mechanisms that are called uplift mechanisms that basically lift air up to a higher elevation where they will experience adiabatic cooling, right? Cooling due to lower pressure in the atmosphere at high altitude. And then the water holding capacity will be diminished 
um, uh, as the air temperature cools and then as a result, condensation will happen, ice, crys or ice crystals will form, and then we have the potential for precipitation to fall back down to the ground. And again, there's four main mechanisms um, by which air is lifted. And the first is basically hot air rises. Um, the second is called orographic lifting. Um, and that's when air is forced over mountains. The third is called frontal lifting, when a warm front um, moves over a cold front or different kinds of air masses collide. And then the, the fourth is called convergent lifting, where air rises as a result of crowding. Um, so we're going to go through each of those four in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the first one, convective lifting, um, basically happens when air gets really hot and we've learned that hot air starts to expand and rise. And so this happens in places where there's lots of solar energy hitting the ground surface, so kind of near equatorial regions, usually in the hottest times of the year. And as the insulation from the sun heats up the ground, it also heats up the air right above the ground, the air starts to rise, and as it expands at higher elevation, it cools down, it maxes out its water holding capacity, water is essentially squeezed out of the air, and then we have these vertical columns of basically clouds that start to form above the locations where the air is rising. So these produce these real vertical like thunderhead type clouds um, that we often see in the summertime. Um, and they tend to drop a lot of vertical rain in kind of a limited spatial area very quickly um, in these intense kind of precipitation and thunderstorm type of events. Um, and these can be very local. So we might have like an intense thunderstorm that is dropping a bunch of rain on East Quincy when there's no rain falling at all um, over in downtown or at the Feather River College campus. Um, and that's kind of um, because they, we might have a convective system that's a, behaving a little bit differently just locally in East Quincy where maybe there was more sun hitting the ground during part of the day um, and it was more clouded in a different area. Um, so it was a little bit more shaded. It wasn't as hot, wasn't as much convection. Anyway, these can be quite local and this is called convective uplift. Um, the next process is called orographic uplift and this can happen um, at any location on the earth, there just needs to be some sort of physical barrier that's in the way that air needs to go up and over. And so this is usually a mountain range. And when air runs into the mountain, it can't go through. So it has to go up. And as it approaches higher and higher elevations, it cools through adiabatic cooling. It maxes out its water holding capacity. Water starts to get squeezed out. And then we have precipitation up high in the mountain. So this is one of the reasons that we have usually higher rain up in the mountains than we do in low land areas. Um, we also see the opposite phenomenon and what we call the leeward side of the mountain, the mountain that's kind of in the shadow relative to the way that the wind is moving, so on the kind of protected side. And as air kind of comes back down the mountain on the far side, um, it actually warms up. And so um, it expands its water holding capacity with warmer temperatures and then there's very, very little rain in these areas that are called rain shadows. So, for example, um, in California we have this um, orographic phenomenon happening um, both over the Coast Range Mountains and also over the Sierra Nevada Mountains that we live in in Quincy. And basically the wind blows from the westerly winds off the Pacific Ocean, it goes across um, the Central Valley, and then it runs into the Sierras and has to go up. And as it rises in elevation, it cools, moisture is squeezed out, and it rains a lot more or snows a lot more in the higher elevations of the mountains. And then as the air comes back down the east side or the lee side of the mountain, um, it starts to warm up a little bit and first of all most of the moisture has already been lost from the air in the higher elevation mountaintops but also any moisture that's left is now even less likely to come out as precipitation because um, the air is warming up a little bit and the water holding capacity is actually increasing. 
So um, as we drive across Highway 80 from the Bay Area to Reno um, in Western Nevada, for example, we see that Sacramento has about 18 inches of rain a year. Auburn, which is really quite close to Sacramento, has 37 inches of rain a year, so almost twice as much rain, um, even though those locations are only about 40 minutes apart. Um, then if you get all the way up to Donner Summit, um, up on the top of the pass before you get into Tahoe, um, there's 50 inches of rain a year. And then dropping back down the other side, Truckee has 31 inches of rain a year. So much less because a lot of the moisture has already been lost um, in the higher mountains and the air is warming a little bit as it comes down slope. And then by the time we get to Reno, there's only seven inches of rain a year. So very, very dry climate um, in Western Nevada because all the moisture has already been lost in the mountains and any moisture that was left is probably not going to be coming out of the air because the air is now a little bit warmer than it was before. And so it can hold, it has a greater capacity to hold any moisture that is evaporated into the air. So um, this rain shadow, rain shadow effect in our part of the world usually is on the eastern side of mountains because our prevailing winds are coming from the west towards the east as part of the westerly winds. But if we lived in a different part of the world where we were experiencing trade winds or polar easterly winds, we would see this phenomenon swapped um, where we would have the west side of the mountains be the dry side and the east side of the mountains be the side where adiabatic cooling and precipitation is happening. So anyway, that's what creates a rain shadow. Um, okay, the third mechanism then is called frontal lifting. So as you might remember, a front is basically the boundary between two different air masses. And so where we have two different kinds of air that have different temperatures, precipitations, humidities, usually that are colliding with each other, coming from different latitudes, um, these air masses will run into each other and then they will not be able to mix well. And what will happen is that the warmer air, right, which is a little bit less dense, will start to slide over the top of the colder air mass. And then that air that started out being warmer will cool off through adiabatic cooling as it gets pushed up to this higher elevation. So it starts warm, but it doesn't stay warm as it moves over um, the other air mass in this frontal lifting process. Um, and so below, you can see this picture of two clouds that form two distinct layers as one air mass is getting pushed over the other. You may have seen this kind of thing in a plane before. And this is um, an example of a frontal lifting mechanism. Okay, finally, we have something that's called convergent lifting. And convergent lifting happens when we have two air masses collide, but in this case, the air masses are very similar. Similar air temperature, similar humidity, similar um, pressure. And so we don't have one air mass that is likely to go up over the other and one that's likely to sink below the other. Um, but instead, as they collide with each other, they're both pushed upwards kind of like a fountain um, basically they're crowded in the place where they're colliding they cannot continue to put more air molecules right at that place near the earth's surface and so the air molecules get pushed up to higher altitudes so this can happen at any time of year in a place where we have um, colliding of similar air masses and on our planet the place where we see this most consistently is at the equator where we have trade winds from the northern and southern hemisphere that are very similar colliding along the equator. We talked about something that's called the intertropical convergence zone or ITCZ before. And we said this is a place where we have very consistent collision of trade winds producing rising air. That rising air in that low pressure zone is um, causing condensation as the air lifts to higher elevations where it's cooling adiabatically. It forms thunderhead type clouds and it produces lots of rain. So we mentioned that usually from space you can see the equator at looking like kind of a belt of clouds around the center um, of the earth because there's such consistent condensation and precipitation in that zone as a result of this convergent lifting. 
Okay, so now that we have all that knowledge, um, the last graph that I'm gonna show you guys for this um, lecture is this, zone, this graph that shows latitude along the bottom, right, with zero being the equator, and then um, the northern hemisphere being on the left side, the southern hemisphere being on the right side, and then inches of precipitation, or centimeters of precipitation, um, shown vertically. And so we can see that areas close to the equator, zero degrees, have high amounts of precipitation. It's skewed a little bit towards the northern hemisphere. Um, and then as we drop down towards around 30 degrees latitude, remember these are high pressure zones where air is sinking down and warming up, um, then we have uh, very low precipitation, precipitation lows. We'll see if these are desert zones in our next topic. Um, and then as we rise back up, um, to about 60 degrees, 50, 60 degrees latitude, we encounter those low pressure zones, which are kind of wet, temperate forest zones of our planet, um, places like Seattle. Um, and then finally, we drop back down to the Arctic or the Antarctic, and we see that those zones are actually very low precipitation areas. So people see pictures of the North Pole or of Antarctica, and it looks snowy, so they think that it must be an area that gets a lot of snow, but in fact, that's not true. It's just very cold. So snow that has fallen there sticks around for a long amount of time. But Antarctica is actually the driest region on our planet um, with almost no new precipitation in any given year. So it's actually a very, very dry zone of our planet. Um, okay, that's all folks. That's what I have. Um, have a nice afternoon.